Well, good evening, uh, everybody. Welcome to another of our In Conversation series. These were loosely based on Anthony Clare's In the Psychiatrist's Chair, uh, which I used to adore many years ago. Anthony Clare was actually a colleague of mine when I was at uh, Bart's. But when I moved to St. George's, I had the honor, the privilege, and the pleasure of working with Henry Marsh, CBE, now best-selling author of uh, Do No Harm and Admissions, two books that I read originally, and I've just actually reread them ahead of this uh, in conversation tonight. So, uh, Henry, let me start by asking you what you think about COVID-19. What do you think about the way that it's been handled in, uh, in this country by our uh, government and by, our, by the NHS? So let's start with that and then we'll hear some more about you. Well, that, that's quite a few questions, Roger. Um, I think the first thing to say is it's obviously terribly easy to be wise in retrospect. And one has to, speaking for myself, I have to think very carefully about my own changing understanding and views of the pandemic as it developed. Since I have always, most of my life kept a diary every day, I actually have documentary evidence of what I thought as the story evolved. Um, and the other point, to state the obvious, and as doctors we know this, it is a new disease. And we, there's an awful lot we just don't know about it. And I'm no epidemiologist, but I know the epidemiologists say each pandemic is different. Um, and talking to one friend of mine, he's actually an astrophysicist, but he is a friend who, is a, who understands modeling and things like that, which I don't because I'm no mathematician. And he said the actual modeling using sort of the R, the R naught figure is, is very crude. It, it tells you the difference between a mass disaster and something that doesn't matter very much. But the rest is, is completely muddled. Because the point is, you, to do it, make a model, you have to give a number to something where often you just don't know. So it's, in many ways, it's a very artificial exercise. And I had some experience that myself when I sat on a government committee to do with CJD. And people were modeling a way for the risk of getting CJD from blood transfusions. And it was incredibly abstract. So I, I have deep sympathy for the government and having to make very difficult decisions on the basis of really very uncertain information. But what I find so enraging is the way I get the impression the government is somehow pretending to be in control all the time. And if you go back to the early stages, Angela Merkel and Germany said right at the start, there are going to be many deaths, whatever happens. Um, and yet, funnily enough, Germany's had a far, far lower number of deaths because they were prepared. Um, admittedly, they were, in effect, a bigger healthcare system. Um, but they could do testing, they could do contact tracing, and their number of deaths so far, compared to this country, is, is quite extraordinarily low. So when our government is saying, you know, international comparisons are difficult, yes, they are difficult and need to be used with care, but it's quite clear this country has done very badly compared to certain other countries. Having said that, France, Spain, Italy have had major problems as well. So there's no, in a sense, there's no great shame in, in having had problems. So what I would like to hear, which of course you don't hear, is a certain amount of duty of candor from the government saying, well, actually, we did get it wrong, but it was very difficult. And lots of other people got it wrong. Do we hear that? No. And then we have all this fast with Cummings, clearly breaking the spirit of the, um, spirit of the lockdown regulations. Uh, I think it's completely pathetic. <laughs> Having said that, I'm very glad I'm not in charge. I would find it very difficult because there is this, I mean, what's so extraordinary about the virus is it somehow is holding up a mirror to almost everything. It's holding up a mirror to international relations, which are coming out really badly, which is, terrifying when you think of the much greater crisis to come with global warming. It's held up a mirror to our value, what, what is the value of a life. I sat on nice, a nice committee for many years where it was £30,000 for one quality. And if you read um, Phil Hammond in Private Eye, who writes a very excellent MD column, this, this week's copy, he says the actual, given that the vast majority of people 
um, who, die, who die from the disease are elderly and are going to die, would have died within a few years anyway. The actual cost of a quali from having a massive economic lockdown is, is, is enormous. So how you find a balance between not trashing the economy, with, which will go on affecting for years and years to come, and at the same time trying to care for the elderly is, is terribly difficult. All one knows is this, this government has blundered around and made a mess of it all. But again, problem, horrible problems in care homes are a, are a worldwide problem. So there are no, there are no easy answers. Would you, would you say that the key mistake was starting the lockdown too late or moving patients from well, hospital I, care I, I hesitate to answer because I'm not an epidemiologist. But paradoxically, I suspect, I may well be wrong, that the, the lockdown was too much too late, in a sense, that by the time the severe lockdown was started, the disease is already very widely spread. And it'll be very hard to know whether the, the, the graphic, you can see that the infections and deaths shooting up exponentially and then tailing off. Um, and there are various people like the physicist Michael, Michael Levitt, you may have seen some of his, um, his um, video interviews, who say, well, actually, this probably was going to happen anyway, irrespective of the lockdown. And then, of course, you have the situation in Sweden where they had a much more relaxed sort of lockdown. And the interesting thing about that is in Sweden, they said from the start, we're concerned about sustainability. Um, and if you saw an interview with Ferguson before he had to resign, um, he was saying, well, of course, it's not sustainable for lockdown. <laughs> so yes, you have a massive lockdown to stop the disease in its tracks, but how do you get out of that? And that's obviously what all the discussion is at the moment. At the end of the day, my own view, I, I suspect, is we just have to tolerate over time a large number of deaths. Um, and it may well be in Germany, which initially, of course, has a low number of deaths, but presumably they have a much larger proportion of the population who have not yet been infected and are therefore at risk. We just don't know. You can only judge, you'd only be able to judge the, the effectiveness of the various vertent and inadvertent policies in, in a year's time or so. Now there's worry about will there be a second wave? But we don't know there was a second wave with Spanish flu, but that doesn't necessarily mean there'll be a second wave with, with COVID. So I, it's, I'm, I'm not critical of the government for getting it wrong. They're, they're, it's very, very difficult and they're fallible human beings like the rest of us. I'm deeply critical for the whole PR spin and pretense that goes on with these, these daily briefings. I'd, I'd like some duty of candor as doctors. We're supposed to be open about mistakes and open about when things are difficult. And I feel the government's been treating the British populace really in a very condescending way, driven yeah. by PR rather than by honest, you know, honest discussion of how difficult the problem is. I tend to agree with you, but it does make watching Newsnight and listening to the Today programme rather interesting to hear the the convolutions uh, of uh, political speak about this and uh, all the controversy. But listen, um, Henry, I, I, I've read your book, there's so many interesting bits in there. You, w one thing you say in there that somebody asked you, why did you go into neurosurgery? And we actually mm -hmm. had a question from Dr. Malik about that. I mean, yeah. Doom and gloom, I think you uh, expressed uh, the view that neurosurgery, especially brain tumors, which you mainly see well, I think, I think when you, when, as, as young doctors, we're all naive optimists, which to a certain extent we have to be. Um, I was subject to the myth of brain surgery being all exquisite and high tech and fantastic, which some of it is, but an awful lot of the diseases we, we can't treat effectively. Um, and there's an awful lot of damage and disability. Um, so I have absolutely no regrets about having had a career as a neurosurgeon. I, 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 so I've been happy with it. It's not quite the right word, but I feel I've been very privileged and lucky. It's been very difficult at times. Um, I didn't realize how, how there was so much misery in neurosurgery when I went into neurosurgery. But that's not that, is that very different from other branches of surgery? All of us have terrible cases and in you know, untreatable illnesses and things like that. Funnily enough, with, with 
in terms of the, that one sound too morbid, in terms of dying from brain tumors, it's one of the more gentler ways of dying because you don't you, you lose insight into what's going on. So it, it, other, I think other forms of death, other forms of cancer, can often be much worse depending on the quality of the palliative care. But the, the suffering for the families is obviously always very great. And you have this added, well, not exactly philosophical, but I was thinking about it for various reasons today. Some of the patients end up with terrible frontal disconnection syndromes, and they're no longer the people they were, and they're changed horribly. They, they don't suffer, but for the family, it is absolutely terrible, as it is the families of patients with severe head injuries. So that, in that respect, neurosurgery is very different from other branches of medicine because people can be so changed from what they, what they once were. In your books, both of your books, um, there's an awful lot of uh, mention of death of patients and, mm. and remorse uh, yourself. I think you start off um, Do No Harm, uh, just giving the, the book a plug there for you. Thank you. <laughs> A few extra copies. You've sold a load of copies already. Yes, yes, yes. Various languages. Um, you start off by saying that you have a suicide kit uh, yes. ready. Uh, was, was that serious? Do you really have a serious? Well, I say I like. I say I like to joke, so it's semi-serious. Yeah. Um, I I um, I I'm a trustee for a charity for a plugin called My Death, My Decision, which is mainly mainly supported by doctors, senior doctors, I aging doctors like me, um, that you the, the assisted suicide should be legal, not just for the the six months fatal illness thing, which in a sense is almost irrelevant because you're going to die anyway. And many people who express an interest in assisted dying, this is from the American experience in Oregon, um, when they have a terminal illness, don't then actually take up the option when it comes. And I know many family friends or medical families where the, the, the doctor, mother or father, having said, I don't want, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to die horribly and please put me out of my misery. When the event came, they, they didn't want it. They just didn't talk about it. They developed this, this sort of split consciousness, which I discuss in one of the chapters, I think. But the real problem is, is dementia. Uh, and you can have insight and you can be diagnosed with Alzheimer's while you're still a mental capacity. And I feel very strongly, I'm pretty certain if I am developed to early Alzheimer's at some stage, I would want to put an end to my life because I hate the idea of being a burden to my family. And Just losing that. your dignity, I suppose. Well, yep. it's, it's my dignity, or it's not so much my dignity, it's just as, I don't want my family to have to look after me when I'm no longer the person I was. Yeah. I see no virtue in being demented at all. So I think there's a very strong, I think it's a hugely strong case for assisted dying to be available on the grounds of intractable suffering, which is the case in Switzerland and Belgium and Holland. Society has not collapsed as a result of this. And I think it's something which will come, just like gay marriage. I think the arguments against it are the same sort of fear and prejudice which which people had against gay marriage your father i think suffered from dementia yes he did he, he died at the age of 96 after at least 10 years he had two head injuries because like me he was a, a terrible do-it-yourselfer but a, even more incompetent than me and he twice fell off ladders and was ending up in hospital once with a small acute subdural and it may well have been these head injuries contributed to it. We know very well that, that head injuries uh, make you more vulnerable to dementia in old age. And you, you were brought up in, in Oxford then? Yes, in Oxford, yeah, until the age of 10, yes. And then I was interested uh, in your uh, sojourn in Oxford and the, 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 uh, the love story there that ended up with you heading north to New. Oh, that's, that's when I was an undergraduate, yes. I was yeah. a very... Um, a very immature teenager, or late teenager. And I was terribly shy of girls, and I fell madly in love with an old woman who's a family friend, which was most embarrassing. And yeah. I couldn't really cope with it, so I, I sort of ran away. Right. <laughs> but then I was, your, 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 well, I, I ran away to... Sorry? 
Your father and mother must have gone nuts when you left. Yeah, they did. It was very difficult for them, but it was a sign of what splendid parents they were, that they kind of said, well, if that's what you want to do, you'll have to do it. Yeah. Where my father yeah, was any kind started. of support uh, from the college, your Oxford college, when that? No, but then I said, well, that's what you want, fair enough. But they did say, well, if you want to come back, come back, which was very kind of them. And when I was away, uh, I, I, a weird series of coincidences, I was working as an as a operating theatre orderly. It used to be called OTTs, Operating Theatre Technicians, <laughs> in, in a mining town north of Newcastle called Ashington. Um, and while there, watching surgeons operate, there was, no, there was no science in my family background or education at all, although my German great-grandfather had been a rural GP in, in rural Prussia at the end of the 19th century. Um, I realized, well, I did want a professional middle-class career after all, and I wanted to be a surgeon. And I never really looked back, although it was only when I was a junior doctor and working as an SHO on the ICU at the Royal Free in Hampstead, that I, I by chance, I saw some brain surgery, an aneurysm operation. And that was it. I knew immediately that's all I'd ever really wanted to do. It was a, it was a genuine epiphany. Mm. Um, we t when looking back on our lives, we tend to think it all had a logical course and we made these clever, wise decisions. Um, the reality is I was driven, I was unhappy. I didn't quite know what I was doing half the time. I was very lucky. I had basically had a, sec a reasonably secure pre-morbid personality, although I've always been a very emotional person. I had very kind parents. Uh, and people were very kind to me on the whole, so that I didn't get off the rails. I came close to running off the rails. I had psychiatric treatment at one time, which I found immensely helpful. But it was also beneficial and it made me um, much more understanding, I think, of, of, of mental illness than some surgeons are perhaps, having had problems myself. But then again, when, when my first marriage ended after 27 years, I pretty well went off the rails again then. And it's only now at the ripe old age of 70 that I think, you know, I'm relatively sensible. <laughs> <laughs> Henry, I showed you, I wanted to show you that. I'm, I'm yeah. sure people will remember it and maybe seen it, it's on YouTube now. But, um, you know, it, it takes me back to my training. And the question I wanted to ask you is, is you know, th those were the times, things have moved on, but there are some aspects of our training uh, in that era, which I think, uh, we, we, we might consider reverting to. So what are your thoughts about modern training as, a, as a, uh, a doctor compared with how it was 40 years ago? I think the, the, and I know many doctors our generation would say the same, the, the loss of the firm has been very difficult for junior doctors. Um, admittedly, our generation worked very long hours and it was very, in that sense, it was stressful. But you had this tremendous sense of belonging. Firstly, you were, you were there all the time. You more or less lived in the hospital. You got to know the nurses, the cleaners, the porters on a sort of first name basis because you were there so much of the time. Um, and also you were part of a little family of the firm. All my bosses, with only sort of one and a half exceptions, were actually very, very kind and very sympathetic. Um, and although one or two of them had slightly Sir Lancelot Spratish tendencies. They were pretty, pretty decent people on the whole. And above all, they cared for their trainees. Um, so it was a tremendous source, source of, of psychological support. Again, of course, the whole culture of medicine is different then. You got away with mistakes. Um, there was much less critical, there was much less litigation. There wasn't all the management and datexes and endless inquiries and this, that and the other. Now, obviously, the fact we don't get away with mistakes so easily now in many ways is better. Uh, and the fact that, you know, cases, I think cases are discussed more is, is better than it was. So there, what was extraordinary about the generation of consultants who trained me was really they didn't discuss cases with each other very much, except maybe at, at um, m and &M meetings afterwards. And then they never were very... Well, even now, I don't think an M&M &M meetings are often very, very effective. But I think there is more joint operating, there's more discussion. 
discussion, that is better, and there is more accountability, and the godlike figure of Sir Lancelot has, has gone. But I think it's, as far as I can tell, it's much more difficult to be a junior doctor now. Yes, they were, in theory, they work shorter hours, but they have the same degree of responsibility. They're harried from pillar to post. They no longer have that sense of belonging. Um, you know, the whole idea of mess life has gone. The on-call room has gone. At, in the neurosurgical department at St. George's, I created a very nice on-call room for them with a carpet and curtains and a bed and a sofa and all, all mod cons. And then in time, of course, the management discovered all this and it was declared a fire hazard, and all, which it wasn't, and was all removed. And then the bed was removed because they were told they no longer should be sleeping on call. So I think being a junior doctor now is, is horrible. Having said that, I don't know that many junior doctors, and some of them tell me they're happy, some aren't. But I think it's, I think the medical, prof medical profession at the bottom of the, the system has, has suffered greatly compared to us. I, think. I, I don't want to sound like an old man saying, oh, things ain't what they used to be. They were so much better when I was a lad. Um, but I think we had a much, we worked in a, on the whole in a much more benign, supportive system than our juniors do now. Yeah, it's another neurosurgeon, Alan Crockard, uh, along with Shelley Hurd and uh, Liz Pace, who were behind the uh, modernizing medical careers, mm. turned out to be a bit of a debacle. They, I think they had some good ideas, but wow, they had a, a, an IT problem and then p other people had to be brought in. It, it didn't end well. There were a lot of very upset uh, yeah. junior doctors. Some of the, my friend's children uh, were amongst the I remember all that, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's, it's a very complicated system. And of course, also different medical specialties of different, different needs. To have one, one size fits all is, is you know, bound to fail. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that, that the new normal that uh, appears at the end of uh, this COVID crisis, if there is an end to it, uh, that, that does give people a chance to think through uh, a new way of dealing with younger doctors who, who I think were desperately upset. Uh, I don't know if you read Rachel Clark's book. Oh yeah, no, no, very much so. I know, I know Rachel, she's a good friend. Um, no, it, it's, 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 every ought to read that book, the, the, Your Life in My Hands. I mean, it's such a contrast to the life I lived as a, as a junior doctor 35 years ago. Absolutely. So, um, Henry, t let's, let's talk a little bit about um, some of the problems that you've had with your patients, because I, yeah. I can't think of another surgeon that's been so honest and frank about his complications. And, you know, your quote from René uh, Lariche at the beginning. Yeah, of yeah yes. In the cemetery. I wish I'd written that myself. Yes. Yeah. 1951, I think that was. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 Well, it's been very, you were the one that publicized it uh, to so many people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, think, looking back, uh, of all the problems you described, which, which do you think is, it would be rank as number one? The one well, the one ones that, the ones that, it's something I've been writing about recently, the ones that hurt me most are the ones where I had a long-term trusting relationship with the patient and the family, and then something went wrong, um, and they felt I'd let them down, and I felt I'd let them down. And the, the, the loss of that long-term trusting relationship was, still is incredibly painful. But as I tell my colleagues, if they had bad problems, I'd say, actually, if it wasn't painful, it would be even worse. You know? yeah. The whole point is, because we care for our patients, it hurts. But it does, you know, it, I think we often forget just how just does our patients need to trust us. So it's, a, it's a mutual relationship. We kept, a, we kept a float, we kept a loft on, on our patients' trust. And when that goes, you hit the ground very hard indeed. And I think the only, the only people who really understand that are fellow surgeons. And, and all of us, I think, have been through it. The extent to which we admit it to others or to ourselves is going to be variable. But well, maybe admitting it actually helps um, deal I, with the... I think to some extent, I, I do feel very strongly, particularly now, that the younger doctors work in a more hostile, critical, bureaucratic, managerial environment. 
I think it's incredibly important that the, the senior doctors set an example of honesty in saying how difficult things are. Yes, we all make mistakes. You know, we are not, we are not the rational logicians which the lawyers expect us to be when we're had up in court over cases. We have to make decisions quickly. We're subject to all the unconscious cognitive biases, as psychologists call them, which as human beings, because we have to estimate probabilities all the time. And when we estimate probabilities, we're often influenced unconsciously um, to, to be inconsistent. Uh, and not, not exactly make mistakes, but just we are inconsistent. And I think it's very important, senior doctors set an example of honesty. I wasn't quite aware of the fact that that's what I was doing when I wrote my first book. Um, but in retrospect, that was what I was doing. And I think it's very important that the Royal Colleges, which I never had much truck for, um, but as many because I'm not a committee sort of person, but I think it's very important the Royal Colleges which have been really very sidelined by the government over the last 20 years. And, more and more of the monitoring and regulations being taken over by the GMC. I think it's terribly important that Royal College has set an example and also try to provide as much support as possible for junior doctors. Whether they're doing this or not, I'm not sure, I don't know. Maybe they are, I hope they are. Well, I, I think, think, think they have a very you, important role to play. Yeah, what you've done is made it, um, I think, uh, admissible to talk about um, one's mistakes and errors because I mean, I know so many of my colleagues that bottle it all up and are ashamed of the things that have gone wrong, but of course, everybody makes mistakes. But I'm, in my career, litigation has been um, uh, reared its head on a couple of occasions. I think uh, you, you mentioned this in your books. I mean, yeah. it's not much fun, is it, being in front of these lawyers? It's very painful. It's like yeah. suddenly, it's as though the carpet's been pulled from under your feet. You suddenly feel incredibly small and vulnerable. We need lawyers and I work in countries like Ukraine and Nepal and Albania where basically justice is who pays the judge the biggest bribe or no. who has most political clout. So we tend to forget that the rule of law is absolutely fundamental to a, a civilized free society. But that having been said, the, the Anglo-Saxon law of tort, common law, medical litigation system is Again, it's like the lockdown, it's like climate change, it's not sustainable. I mean, the NHS now is spending, I think, close to two billion pounds a year on medical legal expenses. Close to 2% of the total NHS budget goes on medical, lit medical litigation, and of that 40% is in legal costs. Now, I'm not saying shoot the lawyers, but surely there must be a, a, a cheaper way of solving the problem. I was staggered when I was lecturing in Stockholm recently that my colleague there said, we don't have consent forms. <laughs> we are a high trust society. I shake my patient's hand, he trusts me. And that of course comes back to the pandemic and the Swedish model of a much more relaxed lockdown is because it's a high trust society. Now, now Scandinavia is anomalous, Sweden's anomalous. I'm not saying we can copy it, but they have no medical litigation, nor does New Zealand because they have no-fault compensation. Now, granted, in Sweden, the uh, um, no-fault compensation is already on the back of very generous social welfare payments. So it's not that big a problem to add it on. But, you know, it's not sustainable, the present system, but there's so many vested interests in continuing with this merry-go-round of more and more litigation. And again, coming back to the pandemic, is interesting, but there are different opinions that will... Uh, Will the pandemic lead to more litigation? Will you assume, given that hospitals have acted like incubators for the virus, and whether we can now have COVID-free hospitals and non-COVID-free hospitals, I don't know. But will people start suing if they get COVID when they're in hospital for some other reason? Um, so we'll have to see. Let's talk a little bit, uh, Henry, about your work abroad, because uh, not many people have worked in uh, Nepal and uh, in the Ukraine. So how did that, both those uh, uh, trips and, and, and that ongoing commitment start? Well, it, 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 it's partly my family background. My, my father was a, basically a human rights lawyer. Um, my mother was a 
a, ref a political refugee from Nazi Germany. They were among the group of people who founded Amnesty International. So it's sort of part of my cultural DNA has always been, you know, we're here to try to make the world a better place. I'm also by nature a, a coward. I'm an anxious sort of person. Uh, you know, it's a slight paradox. I probably became a surgeon in order to prove to myself I wasn't as <clears throat> cowardly as I knew I was. And I always found traveling difficult because I felt out of control and anxious. Uh, and of course, if you go, if you do medical visits, when I go to these strange countries, there's been other strange countries as well. You know, I, I, I'm looked after. I feel, I feel quite safe. So I have the, the pleasure of true travel, which is meeting people in different cultures. And as doctors, we have this enormous privilege. We're still part of an international brotherhood, an international sisterhood. We subscribe, often fail, but we subscribe to an ethic of trying to treat all human beings the same, irrespective of race or class or anything else. I know it often doesn't work out like that, but in principle we do. So it was pure about, and I gain, when I was, before I did medicine, I studied politics and philosophy and economics, what used to be called PPE. PPE now tends to mean something else. Um, and I specialized in Soviet studies. Um, and I, was, I didn't speak Russian, but I was always very interested in Russian politics. Um, so when the chance, purely random chance, arose 28 years ago to go to Ukraine, just after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was a, an extraordinary time, um, I, I was able to go to Ukraine. And that's how it began. Um, and I enjoyed it. It was hard work, it was often very frightening. And I was doing dangerous operations with not very good equipment without any proper legal status. But it, it kind of worked, although eventually I fell out with my main colleague for complicated, not complicated reasons, but if you work in other countries, it's difficult, you know. Yeah. Um, but I now work with younger doctors in Ukraine, though what's going to happen to that now after the pandemic? I don't know. The same in Nepal, and the situation in Nepal is, is not good. I mean, 30% of national income comes from tourism and trekking. That's gone. 30% comes from remittances for people, work, Nepali men working abroad, mainly in the Gulf and Saudi and South Korea. That's gone. Um, so a lot of these so-called, what used to be called third world countries, again, it collapsed back into the third world. So again, it's a way in which the virus has held up a very unflattering mirror to society, not just about old age versus the economy, but about international relations in poor countries and wealthy countries, all sorts of problems. And when you're operating at, uh, or were operating, because did, are you still operating or have you actually stopped now? I, I've, I, I, I did not, I did offer, I was operating a few months ago in Ukraine, but it's mainly just a sort of, reassure my colleagues yeah. uh, and to sort of give them a helping hand. But I, the last major operation I did was two years ago now. In fact, on a Ukrainian woman who came to London uh, um, for me to operate on. And it was a very difficult tumour and thank God it, it went very well. I then saw a similar case a year later in Ukraine who wanted to come to England for treatment. And I decided to send her to one of my colleagues. With the, something I'm writing about at the moment, of a slightly awkward thought, but I suspect he was probably going to get a better result than I could. Not just because I was older, but just, I think he's an incredibly good surgeon. Um, and it's, when you're still in active practice, it's very hard to admit that your colleagues might be better than you are. Um, <laughs> it's the surgical it's easier. When you're starting to retire, you get a bit of detachment. When you're a young consultant, you have to believe in yourself. You have to deceive yourself. You have to, you have to radiate confidence and competence to your patients, even though you know, you know it's not quite the case. It's very difficult. If you don't take on difficult cases, how do you ever get any better? Although you may have colleagues elsewhere who are actually more experienced than you are. And this is a profound ethical problem we all face in the early stages of our careers as consultants. And the way I coped with it was basically self-deception pretending to myself that I was better than I part of me knew I was. It's one of the reliefs of being older when you can drop that and you can stop the, the necessary self-deception. 
did you find retirement? Well, I know you found retirement difficult because you, you mentioned this in your book. And I, I like the story of where you, you got very cross about the nasogastric tube in one of Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, just tell everybody that because... Uh, oh, no, well, I, I was one of the last big cases I did. And technically it was a hemangioparasitoma of the um, foramen magnum. Very difficult case. These are tumours. They're sort of semi-benign. They have quite a high recurrence rate. And they're terribly vascular, and they just bleed and bleed and bleed. And it was a really difficult operation. It took hours and a lot of blood loss. I mean, brain tumors, it's amazing how much blood you can lose. But it went fine eventually, and I could see all the lower cranial nerves. Um, they'd all been stretched out by the tumor. The tumor was pressing on the brain stem and the lower cranial nerves. But they were intact. Um, and when you wake up, he, he had a cough. So I was very happy. Um, he was a bit hoarse due to, due to weakness of the glossopharyngeal innervated muscles, but he could cough, so I was quite certain he wasn't at risk of aspirating. Now, he had, before the operation, a Gordon of the notes, so when he, pre he presented with resident cranial pressure and swallowing difficulties, and some idiot of an intensivist, uh, this was, of course, in the good old days, all the patients on the I, I managed everything, the anesthetists were just there to spin the knobs on the ventilator. I mean, that's changed. Oh, yes, yes, a good thing it's changed. But some idiot intents for put a nasogastric tube down, quite unnecessarily, on the grounds, oh, he's at risk of aspirating, which he wasn't. And in fact, you know, putting a nasogastric tube down in some ways can make things worse, as well as which is extremely unpleasant, and it's an invasive procedure. So I, kept, I always went in at night to see my patients because I lived near the hospital, and I was pretty cross when I saw it, but I thought, oh, well, I'll leave it in overnight and take it out in the morning. So I went in early next morning and said to the nurse, take the nasogastric tube out. And he said, no, it has to be cleared by salt, speech and language therapy. And I just lost it. And I, was partly, I suppose I lost it partly because I was going to retire in two weeks' time. But, you know, this was a, mis a medical error had been made that the tube should not have been put down. And some damn nurse was then telling me, no, I was not entitled to say remove it. So I sort of grabbed him by the nose and said, I hate your cut. Because <laughs> it's completely mm. spontaneous, you know. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then I apologised afterwards. Of course, I got pulled over the curls a bit. And in fact, because uh, I was about to retire and the matron was an old colleague and you know, I could easily have gotten an awful lot of trouble. But yeah, you could have got suspended. I didn't. But it was still makes me very angry in retrospect. You know, here I was entirely, I knew what I was doing. And you're dealing with people who did not know what they were doing. And then they could countermand me. And that's crazy. And that's kind of a reflection of what's happened to a certain extent. Yes, we don't want to go back to the days of Sir Lancelot Spratt. Um, but in some ways, the pendulum has gone to the other extreme now, partly because of more and more specialization, larger numbers of doctors, less personal contact. The relationship I had years ago with my anesthetist was really very good indeed. And it was a very relaxed, friendly, cooperative atmosphere on the intensive care unit as well. And I think that's changed over the years. It's much more like what we expect from general ICUs, where there's a lot of tension between the surgeons and the intensivists, or can be. And that's very sad. Yeah, we've got a question from Jennifer King here. Uh, so many questions coming in. I haven't got time, I'm afraid, to uh, ask you all of them. But in your book, Do No Harm, you express mm. quite negative, maybe cynical views of NHS management. Do you still feel that way? And if so, what needs to change? Uh, well, it's, it's easy to slag off the management, isn't it? I, I mean, I was, the frustrations of all the, the the mandatory and statutory training, the one size fits all, I think is, is very inefficient. Um, we need to be managed, obviously, there's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, my experience of it was on the whole, but it was pretty, pretty lacklustre. It may partly have been the hospital I worked at. You know, what it was years ago, my main anaesthetist was an amazing guy called Terry Gould, who, believe it or not, um, after qualifying as a doctor, then went joined the fleet air arm and became a carrier-based jet fighter pilot <laughs> and did various various extraordinary experiments with ejector seats and underwater escape systems ended up as an anesthetist he was a mobsman 
But at one point he became the manager for the local geriatric hospital, which was part of St. George's, the Bolingbroke on Wandsworth Common, you may remember it. Of course it got closed and amalgamated in the way of all the small hospitals <laughs> did. But when he was a manager, he would go around the hospital every morning, walking around like a, like a captain of a ship, um, talking to the staff, commenting on whether it was clean or not. And I, as far as I could see, the hospital worked beautifully. What puzzled me over many years at St. George's, I never saw the senior management. I got through about eight or nine chief executives over the course of almost, almost 30 years. And they'd, you'd meet them when they were appointed, they'd come round once. And then you didn't see them again unless you got into trouble, which I did occasionally by being too outspoken on the media. But otherwise, you occasionally got summoned to large meetings with them. And it struck me, God, was it not possible for the chief executives to go around each department once a year and talk to the consultants? I mean, it's not being saying the consultants are more important than anybody else, but the consultants are the longest term staff, on, with a few exceptions in the hospital. They're terribly, they're very important. But there was no contact with the management. There was a complete us and them. What Which about your colleagues? You know, problems in some departments, uh, I'm thinking cardiac department in Oxford, for example. Cardiac um, department in St. George's. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's between colleagues. Did, yeah. did, did you ever run into any kind of strife? No, no not really. I was very lucky that I always, I always worked in a rather happy, relaxed department. There were no major conflicts. But it was partly because the number of consultants until only recently was always fairly small. And on the whole, as numbers expand, for many years I was one of three or one of four. We all have, we were all very busy. I was operating four days a week. You didn't coincide very much with your colleagues. Um, all that has changed now, but A, because there are more consultants, there's more problems about operating theatres and organising things. Um, and, and, but it's partly potluck as to people's personalities, whether they get on together or not. Um, I think things are changing a bit in, in my old department now. Um, but I never had major problems. I always thought... Would was you give any advice to younger surgeons about... Yeah, care? always, never, always step back from yourself. Yeah. Never lose your... Losing, I occasionally lost my temper. Losing one's temper is always a warning sign. You're frightened of something. You're about to make a mistake. Um, I'm a pretty, fairly impetuous person. And what I've had to learn over the years is to control my feelings, to, to think carefully before I talk. Um, you may not believe that, but I do actually think about <laughs> what, I, what I say quite carefully. And I try to make sure I'm standing on thick ice rather than thin ice. But I think it's, it's hugely, the point is you can divorce your spouse you can't easily divorce your colleagues. Uh, and we all know departments where, you know, they, they all hate each other. And it's terribly destructive. It's destructive of patient care uh, and destructive of teaching and training. You have to compromise to some extent. You know, that's what it comes down to. Likewise, working in, in, in foreign countries of different cultures, you have to compromise. I mean, I've seen some of the things I've seen or had to kind of collude with working overseas I found very very unpleasant but I felt well for the greater good you know it's a price worth paying although eventually in Ukraine uh, I couldn't tolerate it any longer I felt my colleague had just become too basically too dogmatic and arrogant and too unsympathetic but it's really I mean it's also you know be a good colleague and if you're a good colleague your colleagues are like probably going to be good colleagues in return but I think having good colleagues is absolutely critical to running a successful, happy surgical department. We all have big egos. We all need to believe in ourselves. Our patients have to believe in us, in us. Uh, and we have to take their dependency and adulation with a, with a grain of salt uh, and realize we're not quite as wonderful uh, and realize our colleagues have problems as well. Having said that, some of one's colleagues can just be a complete pain in the butt, and then that can be very difficult. Henry, I wanted to do, we've got about 10 minutes left, something like that. Um, so let's focus a little bit on write, medical writing. There's mm. a question um, uh, here from Alexandra 
done in Bor Borkuska. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and she says, uh, why did you decide to write books? Is writing something you've always done? And what advice would you give to uh, other budding authors? There must be loads of doctors that wish they yeah. could write a bestseller like you. So any, any well, words? Yeah, of words? First of all, I've always written. I come from a rather bookish family. Uh, I wrote, I wanted to be a poet when I was a teenager, like many teenagers. I'm glad I destroyed all the poetry I wrote, thank goodness. Um, so writing has always been very close to me. I've, always, I've kept a diary most of my life from the age of 12, and it's really therapy for me. And when I was going through a very traumatic divorce more than 20 years ago, the writing about it became increasingly important to help me cope with it, because it was actually very difficult and carrying on working at the same time. Um, in terms of the advice about writing, is very simple. Um, never, use, never use two words when one will do, and show what you write to other people, and get comments, criticism, just like my mantra for better medicine is, is open discussion. It's the same with writing. Um, my, one of my daughters, God help me, is a novelist, um, not yet published, but, but already won shortlist to the one prestigious prize, which is wonderful, proud father. She went to the, she did the, 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 the go-to creative writing master's degree at the University of East Anglia, the one started by the novelist Malcolm Bradbury, Wangia and McEwen, and I think Angela Carter, a lot of famous writers went there. And one of the things you do there, you write, and then you read it to your group, and then receive comment and criticism. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's would, would my main advice. Um, and then, well, as, as, as you know, medicine, there are many aspects to what makes medicine interesting, but one of the most important is, is our patient stories. All our patients have life stories. I always liked, but found it quite painful sometimes with the unconscious patients on the ICU, the families would sometimes put a photograph of the patient as they were before the catastrophe to remind us that this was a human being with a story. Um, how you write about your patients. Um, I mean, on the whole, there have been medical memoirs have fallen into two main categories. There are the sort of shock horror young doctor ones, of which um, Adam Kay's This Is Going to Hurt is a modern example, it's sort of very scatological and full of obscenities. <laughs> and the earlier ones, like, you know, Doctor and Richard Gordon's Doctor on the House, which the movies are based on. And then you have the memoirs written by older doctors, usually out of retirement, which, dare I say, until I came along, tended to be recitals of success <laughs> rather, than, rather than trying to come to terms with one's own fallibility and mistakes. Uh, and I might, I'm accused of having started a whole new literary genre. You go into W.H. Smith and see crime, non-fiction, tragic life stories, and now you've got medical confessions as a, as a separate category. But I've always found writing very helpful. I'm struggling with it at the moment, but I still write because I just feel better for it. What I'm writing now may well never see the light of day. I'm very, very lucky that my second wife, Kate, who's an anthropologist and a brilliant writer, is a wonderful critic, and everything I write I show to her. With my first book, um, I showed it to her, after she'd been through it, it was half the size. I then showed it to our literary agent, and after he'd been, it was a quarter of the size. <laughs> it then went to the editor, and it was an eighth of the size. And each time it got better. <laughs> yeah, less is more, I guess. Less is more, less is more. Well, yeah. Christina... the, other, the other standard advice is show, not tell. You know, Paint a picture, don't describe it, show, not tell. Christina Trifonov says, when should we expect your diary entries in a third book? So you, you, uh, you've got book number three. Uh, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I recently shredded seven years of private practice correspondence because I finally no longer needed to keep it. And I went around to mailbox, etc., cetera, the great towering pile of cardboard boxes, shredded the lot. My, my diary is an even bigger towering pile, and I'm seriously thinking I ought to shred it all and just leave it. So I can't quite decide what to do with it. I want to leave a sort of clean pair of heels behind myself. I'm trying to 
declutter. So mm. I don't know. What but about I, what about COVID as a subject for a book? Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm writing about. Not not the, the technicalities of it, because I'm not. An, I'm no longer practicing medicine. Um, I did sign up to go back to the NHS, but rather at least I wasn't needed. So, um, <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm trying to write about that. But really, what worries me is 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 for all of us is climate change, like the very fine so-called fine weather we're having at the moment. Yeah, um, Medi Mediterranean the, weather, isn't it? It's exactly. quite remarkable. Yeah, yeah. But s say you had gone back. Say they said, Henry, um, you know, we've got a backlog of neurosurgical cases because we have. Yes. Yeah. brain tumours that need dealing with. Yeah. How would you feel now sitting back in that chair operating? Oh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to do it. I'd, but I'd like to find out if I could. I think I can still do it. And I'm, I'm pretty sure I can. Would you feel more nervous now, do you think? or? Uh, I don't know. Um, I, would, I tried to remember when I was operating a few months ago, or earlier this year in Ukraine, um, as was I was helping a colleague. No, it wasn't. It was in it was in Kathmandu. It was actually a rather difficult intramedullary spinal cord tumor. Um, I was I always felt nervous when operating. I was always nervous, excited, and that really didn't change very much over the years. Except it would take it would be much it was much more difficult to get me seriously nervous when I was younger. I'd get really pretty scared sometimes, but always in control. And that's the interesting thing is that. It is something about so-called steady hands. I don't ever remember, even when being very stressed, I don't think I ever sort of lost it or my hands didn't start shaking or something. You go into a sort of overdrive. It's, it's, it's curious. I suppose it's a bit like going on stage for, for an actor, isn't yes, it? Yes, I think so. I think that's right. And that's an interesting, buzz. Buzz. It's an interesting analogy because it's a similar with talking to patients. If you don't actually feel what you're saying to them, it's no good. But like an actor, you know, if you're an actor, if you don't have someone feel what you're saying, you're a hopeless actor. But once you walk off the stage and once you walk out of the, off the ward round, then you can make sort of, you know, black jokes about the, the, the patient. We have this sort of split, split consciousness role playing. It's, it's hard to put into words, but very real. Well, it's, it's coming near to the end, but there's, there's one question from uh, Chi Katsura. Che Katsura said, Mr. Marsh, he says very respectfully, hmm. is there anything particular that you'd like to uh, tell the medical students or advise the medical students? I think that's a, that's yeah, a I'm often asked that. I think the, the soft, shortest answer is ask for help. If you don't know what you're doing, ask for help. Yeah. Don't be ashamed to feel you're out of your depth, which comes back to where we started my criticism of the government. who feel obliged to pretend they're, well, they're sort of asking help. They say, we're following the science. When mm -hmm. they all say, this is really difficult, you know, really, really difficult. Um, so ask for help. And I, I can think of many patients who came to harm under my care as a junior doctor, because I was either too frightened or too proud to, to ring up my senior and say, look, I need some help. That's, I think that's, that's excellent advice. Uh, well, I, I think, you know, Henry, I mean, again, rereading your books and talking to you, I think um, humility is a, is a great uh, adjective for you and empathy. You're a very empathic uh, surgeon. I know lots of surgeons that are lacking in those two, two well, characters. It's, it's self-defense, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's all, all these psychological truths are paradoxical. I mean, to stand up in public and say, I make mistakes, you have to be extremely self-confident <laughs> if you think about it. <laughs> yeah, I suppose that's right. And and the last question, I mean, looking back now, is there anything else that you, th you would have done? Uh, a different career, a lawyer, a writer? A no, is there anything I would have, well, architecture. I would have liked, uh, architecture is my other great interest. Um, and my all my woodwork. I just may, I spent the first two months of a lockdown making a very elaborate three foot, three foot high doll's house for two of my granddaughters. It was a little Georgian house with an elaborate staircase and sash. It was great fun. No, architecture would be my second choice in this little oh. game one plays. Well, hopefully there's, a, there's uh, many more years for you to do all sorts of interesting things, Henry. Well, I think, uh, yeah. we better wind it up and say thank you okay. to you. Well, thank you, Roger. No, it was a nice oh. Oh, always fun to talk to you, Henry. Uh, so to tell uh, uh, everybody that's joined uh, in this evening, thank you so much for 
taking the time and trouble to watch this on uh, R the RSM. I'd like to remind you that next week, very excited to, to have Michael Palin, who was actually signed up to come and give an in-person uh, in conversation at uh, the Royal Society of Medicine, but uh, this little virus came along and interrupted all that. So he's agreed very kindly to do a Zoom for us, and uh, I think that's going to be fun. Uh, I'll show one or two video clips uh, of some of his more humorous things, and we'll get his comments back. Uh, I'd also like to uh, say that the Royal Society of Medicine, you know, we, we're struggling right now because of the COVID crisis. We normally rely on income from our building in number one Wimpole Street, but that's closed, completely closed. So uh, we're having to work now online, but our income stream has, uh, has plummeted. And in order for us to continue our good work supporting doctors of all seniority, as senior as Henry or as junior as uh, medical students, uh, any kind of uh, support, charitable support for the RSM from you would be much appreciated. And one final thing to say is that uh, uh, on the 11th of June, we have a new departure for the RSM. We're having an online wine tasting event with Jane McQuitty, wine correspondent of the Times, who in conjunction with David Gleave, whose brother happens to be a urologist, who uh, set up Liberty Wine, based in Clapham actually, probably where Henry was uh, near to where Henry was brought up. And Jane and David have chosen six summer wines and over three consecutive Thursdays, uh, if you order uh, a case of these six wines, we, uh, we're going to taste uh, online, um, uh, uh, a wine tasting event. Jane and David will be talking about these Italian wine, summer wines uh, and you'll also get uh, recipes from the River Cafe. Ruth Rogers has supplied us recipes. So we're talking about summer food, summer wine, something else other than COVID-19. So finally, Henry, thank you so much. Uh, you're as good online as you are uh, on text oh, you're too bad. and in the operating theatre. So Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Henry. And thanks for uh, joining us here. Goodbye. Bye-bye.